Hey, hey everybody. So I have two developers from the Windows Mixed Reality team coming over to talk about 3D assets and using them in the 3D launcher. I'm gonna have some fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, 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 so one thing that I really want to do with this video is answer the why question. Like why should people be doing this? Yeah, yeah. I think like the main thing here is like Windows Mixed Reality has been out and people have been doing some really cool things with it. Yeah. And the number one thing that people say when they get into the cliff house is like, wow, there's some really cool apps and I can see the apps have this mm -hmm. 3D representation and you can look around and yeah. the apps are there. Uh, and then um, they, they ask us like, so how do I do that? Like, how do I put my own 3D representation for my app as yeah. a developer? And then we tell people, yeah, well, there's this five pages of documentation. You can figure out how to do it. There's a lot of steps. Um, but instead, you can just use this tool. And mm -hmm. with this tool, you can just uh, convert your, your 3D models and uh, get them in the, in the cliff house. So the why is really like you want to have a branding for your app that is beyond that little tile on the start menu. It's something right. in 3D. It has a visual representation on the house, and people can really relate to it. Yeah. So a lot of the data we have is actually from working hand in hand with a bunch of third party developers that were trying to ad adapt their app yeah. and like add a 3D launcher and it was just this terrible process. And so this is then trying to kickstart that flywheel of developer progress yeah. in the space. The it's main brain, yeah. thing that people kept asking for was the ability to do this, to actually set the 3D tiles, just because for one full release cycle, yeah. it was an internal feature. It was only something that well, Microsoft first party, first -party apps, apps could do. do. Yeah. Yeah. And so as you kind of pull through the developer forums, that was the main request that we kept seeing bubble up, was just like, how do I start getting volumetric content in the space that's not yeah. And also as another data point, when we published it to the web, which was what, like two weeks ago, mm -hmm. now there's like 50 stars on GitHub, there's two forks, there's two pull requests. So it's like, there's already an active community farming around the project, which is pretty yeah. interesting. That's something that I didn't really expect. I thought it was like, use those tools and people are gonna use it. it yeah. But no, it's actually like people want to change it and improve yeah. it and add new features. So I, I think that's also good. So uh, right now we, we have the command line as kind of our development asset. Art mm -hmm. pipeline. Yeah, yeah, art pipeline. The, because the advantage of command line is very easy to like create a pipeline, like yeah. do something like, oh, you convert from FBX to GLTF and then you do some optimization mm -hmm. and then you run through the toolkit and then you get a, an asset. So this, this kind of stuff, it's like, you need to be able to pipe them through, make yeah. batch files and that's how art studios usually work. And that's actually what I'm most interested to see kind of what developers are looking for with this. Because mm -hmm. I think we, by entering the mixed reality space, but with a UWP mindset, you've got these developers that are primarily used to building 2D apps, yeah. but we're giving them this little piece of 3D value that the startup cost isn't too massive to get into. And so is there more of an interest in these, like you, you just click one button and it all works for you, yeah. you, like there's no customization beyond that? Or are we more addressing the art pipeline side of the world where we've got professional 3D artists that are kind of building tooling around? And so we've started yeah. with something that's almost in the middle with the, like, You've got the release yeah. XE if you just want to have the one-click solution, um, but you can crack open the whole source and build your own pipeline too if you want to. Uh, but I think we're definitely looking at yeah, what's that next cut of mm -hmm. one or two clicks get you what you need, um, and you kind of abstract all the nitty gritties of. Oh, uh, let's see. I think it would be fun to just do a quick walkthrough, show the avocado in and out. <laughs> avocado. That's my let's do it. Our sample. You want to sit down maybe yeah. on there? See, it's so easy. You can start with a fresh machine and be ready to go in 10 minutes. <laughs> All right, so let's see what we have here. So this is a, it's okay. just a sample that we uh, are shipping to the Windows Universal samples. Mm -hmm. But really, uh, the sample shows two scenarios that are in our documentation. So you can also look at all the code we're going to show is very well documented in, in uh, our uh, MSDN developer hub. Why don't we just open that sample? The mixed reality model sample. There is our beautiful Windows platform sample. Did you guys pay, pay somebody to design that or did you do it yourself? I mean, paint 3D is very complicated. <laughs> uh, when we talk about engaging users and bringing <laughs> yeah. them to your application, yeah. who doesn't want to take this flat 
3D text. Oops, sorry, everybody. Put it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an example of a secondary tile uh, where you can just put the tile on the world. Yeah. Uh, and you can, again, imagine creating a tile at runtime with user content. There's some really cool things you can do uh, that are way beyond just this hard-coded um, mm -hmm. GLB. And then the second option there is uh, using file open. So if you click select, you're going to get a, a file picker. And then you could go to the 3D objects folder or to the desktop or somewhere and then pick something out. So here, let's, let's show you an example of why do you need the, the GLTF converter tool. So if you go to the desktop right now, there should be a yeah, right there, desktop on the top right. So if you add this avocado, this avocado came straight from Remix with no conversion whatsoever. So if you click place, mm -hmm. you're probably going to get an error. There you go. You got an error because this has not been optimized yeah. for mixed reality. It doesn't have the texture conversions and all the things that, that we require on documentation. So let's uh, just show that how it works. So I'm going to get you out of the headset. Sorry, Tom. So I'm not taking it off. You, you <laughs> can stay there in, in mixed reality while we go and do the conversion. <laughs> So here I have the, the GLB, and here I have the Windows MR Asset Converter that I got straight from GitHub. Once again, let's take a look here. Um, on github.com slash Microsoft slash GLTF Toolkit. So this is where the toolkit lives, and all the source code and usage is all there, very well documented. And you can go to the releases tab and get just the EXE if you don't want to compile. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's just run that. So let me open a CMD, uh, CD desktop and open Windows MR and pass the avocado. So the conversion will do all the things that we require. We'll do the swizzling, the texture packing. Mm -hmm. uh, it will convert all the texture to DDS and export again as GLB. So we got this avocado converted now. And remember, you can always uh, open those in Windows Mixed Reality Viewer, which yeah. is pretty cool. Like the same way we had a photo viewer in Windows, I don't know, since Windows 95. Now we have a 3D viewer that opens GLTF files native to Windows. So here's the original avocado, and I'm going to open the converted one, but you'll see it will look identical, or it should look identical. So it looks identical. It's the same. Um, so if you're not losing a lot of uh, the resolution of it or a lot of the details, for it, right, it kind of keeps it the same. Yeah. So the way the conversion works is we create new textures for the converted and packed textures, but we keep the original textures there. So your okay. original PNG texture is still there. So if you open with any editor that's not mixed reality, you can get exactly the same oh, result. Okay. But if you open in mixed reality, uh, the textures are resized. Uh, by default, we resize to 512 by 512, but you can choose that resizing okay. as a command line parameter. So you're not actually losing anything. You use the same asset across multiple different things exactly. because it, it has the options to use yeah. them both. It's yeah, it's additional data yeah. rather than ripping things out. Mm -hmm. So now if you go back to uh, the, the, the house here, and I'm going to give Tom the, the control. Uh, so if you turn around and uh, try to place the, the other avocado, Select it's the desktop right there, and then we've got our. So remove the bounding box and then place the GLB. There you go. Now we got an avocado. So avocado. So what does the bounding box do? So the bounding box is if you want to kind of crop the model, so mm -hmm. you want to select a piece of the or model, part of it, yeah. uh, or you want to like recenter it. Mm -hmm. So for example, I want it to be in the corner of my tie or to the left. Yeah. This is uh, the, like. This is mostly used when you have a single asset with different pieces. So you could have like a giant asset that has like multiple things, and mm -hmm. then you can change between it by just changing the bounding box. Which one? So that's pretty cool. Kind of like a sprite, basically. Almost yeah. like a 3D sprite, yeah. Um, so this is an example, and you can see it looks just like it, it looked in uh, in in the sample. And sorry, yeah, in, the, in, in the in View 3D. Mm -hmm. But now when you click on it, it launches the app again. So yeah. you can use that to launch a 2D app, which is an okay experience, but I think it's the coolest experiences when you launch 3D apps. Yeah, like let's actually check that out right now. So uh, as I was kind of talking about before with the design guidance, mm -hmm. I think Halo is actually, well, I'm going here. Uh, Halo is a pretty good example of that, where maybe an avocado doesn't make much sense for our Windows platform sample app, mm -hmm. um, but within Halo, you get the full Halo helmet, right? So that's going to send you straight into the experience. Now, another thing, too, is I think with how we've designed the house, it makes it kind of interesting because we've left a lot of these surfaces available. So what I always enjoy seeing as I walk around the office and see kind of how people have their environment set up is a lot of time people use spaces like this, this big kind of open um, uh, open shelf area, and they'll anchor their apps there. So you might mm -hmm. have, uh, let's say, you know, my Halo 
my Halo app here. And then these are just standard holograms as well from mm. the holograms app. So you can move them around and decorate. Where you put your trophies. Yeah. Exactly. And you can see those from holograms, they are an example of app, uh, of holograms that are not uh, launchers. You can't, they're not actionable. You can't really do anything. Yeah, you can just decorate your house with them. So that's uh, that's the feature we're adding on onto ours uh, for. So I noticed you put like four different or three different uh, launchers for Halo around the house. You can put multiple around the house. You don't have to do just one. Absolutely. Yeah, um, that's a great point. That, that's actually a good example of thing that you don't do on start menu. Uh -huh. Like yeah, usually you have yeah. one icon yeah. per, but uh, we recommend uh, as an app developer to allow people to create multiple copies of your launchers or even secondary tiles. Yeah. Uh, because you might have like a giant house and different rooms and you want to put Halo everywhere because you always want to go to Halo. stay in here for the rest of the <laughs> So Tom has been playing with his headset for the past 15 minutes and won't let us talk to him. I'm not coming back out. It's way nicer in here. Ooh. Another cool thing that kind of to tie together with the other episode is Simplygon, of course. Uh, so if you have a model that has more than 10,000 polygons, which mm -hmm. is very common, like when you make a model with Maya or even yeah. with Paint3D, it's very easy to pass the 10,000 polygon model. Uh, so you can use something like Simplygon to do conversions, to convert to GLTF, and also to resize, uh, or sorry, simplify the asset so decimate it down to 10,000 polygons. So that's a good example. So if you take a look at the other episode, uh, understand more about Simplygon, you can use their cloud service to do that. Even at runtime, which is really cool, you could like, at runtime, take a really complex asset, do changes at runtime, convert with Simplygon, and then convert, convert using GLTF toolkit. Um, and uh, we're excited to announce that the GLTF toolkit will now support UWP, so that mm -hmm. means you're gonna be able to um, to, to create those assets at runtime, not just using the command line, but you can use our library inside your app at runtime to take some user-generated content, do some modification yeah. on GLTF, and generate your GLB. And that's all on the GitHub. That's all in GitHub. All on GitHub, yeah. great. And uh, if you have any features that you want, please send us a pull request yeah. or put an issue there. Uh, we are very active. Uh, we currently have two uh, features. One was the UWP wrapper was a yeah. pull request by John from the math team. He happens to work at Microsoft. And another one is uh, from uh, our friends at the DirectX team. They actually put a pull request for mesh optimization. So mm -hmm. you can now, inside GLTF Toolkit, do a step where it's gonna take your meshes, uh, reorder the vertex buffers so that mm -hmm. it loads faster without changing anything visually. And also, um, do things like generate not normals, generate tangents. Yeah. So things that DirectX Mesh can do, now you can do it inside your GLTF app as well. We're super excited about GLTF. There's so many companies that are kind of behind this standard, yeah. like Microsoft, Google, Facebook. Um, anyone that's working with VR, really, it's interesting in this format because it's the first time the, the industry came together and said, this is what we want to adopt as a runtime 3D format. Much like JPEG and PNG are for pictures or MP3 for sound. Now we have something that is just as, or getting just as popular with so many yeah. converters like Maya, Blender, all those things uh, can be sparked with GLTF as well. Yeah, I really think it has that potential to become the format that my friends who aren't doing 3D related stuff will start seeing kind of come through their machine. GLTF came out with their initial spec and mm -hmm. the GLTF delivery format was really good for delivering uh, assets through uh, web services because you can kind of piecemeal bring down the, the texture sets and different LOD levels if you need to. Uh, but then the binary format or the GLB format is what we've kind of found resonates most with users, like mm -hmm. end users. Uh, they can kind of just think of it as just one simple blob that they can move around their, their disk. And so when we're think, doing things like assigning these tiles um, or dropping secondary tiles yeah. in the world, it's kind of the easiest transfer format for, for what we're working with for our scenarios. Yeah. Now, the, we've got all the nitty gritty of, you know, here's how you optimize these textures yeah. and this is how you generate a GLTF and, and get something ready for the house. But uh, another thing that's worth mentioning too is what do I actually design for my 3D asset? So uh, we've worked on an initial set of design guidance uh, that we've uh, posted on the Mixed Reality Developer documentation that I recommend people go and take a look at. Um, this is our first stab at 
When you're starting to think about what your 3D launcher might look like, what are some of the considerations that you should keep in mind? So how should you be sizing text and positioning it? What are some of the do's and don'ts of how you can make that relate to the 3D mm -hmm. object? Um, how do you actually pick what the object is? Should you pick one of your favorite characters from your game? Uh, or s kind of think just about volumetric text. So there's a lot of good recommendations in there of how you can get started. So uh, before colors, you start, yeah. yeah, colors that work well. So before you start drafting things up and kind of getting into the headset, you can get a sense for what you might actually want to go into. And this is continuously evolving documentation too, right? This exactly. So this is something that, you know, we're not saying that we've got it right out of the gates, but it's just from our experience working with this. And I think based on what we're seeing, from uh, different pieces developers are creating and really from working with them we're going to see um, and kind of continue refining that documentation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now another thing to note is right now they are just static launchers so yeah. you, we don't support animations or sounds or anything uh, but it is something that we're really interested in getting a sense for mm -hmm. from the developer community is like how much interaction how much interactivity uh, folks are looking to drive into the individual launchers. So that's certainly something we'll have our eye on in the, in the forums. And what's the best way for developers to provide feedback on this? Like somebody really, really wants to have that animated yeah. launcher, like how do they actually get you to do it? Yeah, so the, the best way right now, uh, I'd say, is going through the Windows Feedback Hub, set the content or the category to mixed reality, um, and we'll end up seeing that feedback come straight across our desk. So uh, that's a great channel. If you have feedback for the tool itself, the GLTF toolkit, anything related there. We're really active on GitHub, so recommend just open up issues directly there. Uh, we'll take a look and work with you on GitHub. Great. And everything you showed today, the sample, the window sample, the GitHub repo with the tool and all the documentation, it's all public right now. Mm -hmm. Everything's yeah. available, anybody can do it. Yeah, so the sample uh, is going to be released in the next rev, so I don't know when the, oh, okay. the video will be released. Uh, the next rev of the samples usually happens about once a month, if you look mm -hmm. at the history, mm -hmm. uh, but it's already been approved, so it's uh, whenever uh, they flip the switch and okay. send a, a new batch of samples is going to be in that batch. Yeah. So that, it's yeah. it's definitely coming and it's definitely ready to go. Okay. Uh, and GLTF toolkit is definitely uh, already open source, already public. Again, already taking pull requests. Yes. Uh, and all the documentation that we talked about, it's all on MSDN, uh, okay. on the mixed read. Uh, so mixed I'll, I'll link below the video and people can go in and get all this stuff and they can get started immediately. Absolutely. It sounds like the, the barrier of entry for this is, is minimal. You just get a command line tool or or just load it into your app to do it on the runtime and you're good to go. There's not exactly. much you can mess with. Yeah, it's like if you, if you don't change any of the default parameters, you're gonna get something that works, except if, as long as you have less than 10,000 polygons. That's the mm -hmm. only thing that we don't really, we can't really simplify it for you. Mm -hmm. But uh, as long as the, the model is, is there, uh, you just call the, the command line and then you can tweak parameters if you want. You can do cool things like LODs and so on if you, if you know what you're doing. Uh, but and if you really really want to customize your your pipeline, you can just take the source code, create your own command line tools, yeah. your own plugins. That's really why we we made this all open source. I think like the potential for people to run with this and do cool things that we haven't even dreamed of. It's it's really what's exciting. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited about that as well. Very cool.